This is Charlotte Talks. I'm Mike Collins. I just want to say one word to you. Just one word. Yes, sir. Are you listening? Yes, sir, you. Plastics. Exactly. How do you mean? There's a great future in plastics. Think about it. Will you think about it? Yes, I will. I've said. That's a deal. In 1967, when the film The Graduate was released, that seemed like good advice. Plastics were coming into their own. There seemed to be no end to what plastic could do or the new uses to be found for them. There was no downside. That realization came later. Consumers loved replacing their glass shampoo bottles with plastic bottles that wouldn't break in the shower if dropped. Manufacturers liked working with plastic because it was inexpensive, moldable, could be used for nearly everything, and it reduced the weight of products. But slowly, over time, we realized that plastic lasts forever. And because it was cheap, we were fine with just throwing it away and having it disappear into landfills. But some of that plastic escaped our grasp and ended up flooding natural areas and waterways and interfering seriously with nature and wildlife. That's one reason most municipalities started recycling programs. But in truth, only 9% of all the plastic ever produced, 9%, has ever been recycled. So today we talk about the impact of that reality, how plastics are wreaking havoc on wildlife, and how this has become a global problem in search of a global solution, but one in which each of us has a role to play. Dr. Jenna Jambach is a National Geographic Fellow and Associate Professor in the College of Engineering at the University of Georgia and internationally recognized for her research on plastic waste in the ocean. And she joins us via Skype from Athens, Georgia. Good morning and welcome. Good morning. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome. Laura Parker is a staff writer for National Geographic who specializes in covering climate change and marine environments and is reporting on National Geographic's Planet or Plastic series to raise awareness about the global plastic trash crisis. She is with us by phone from Washington, D.C. Thank you for being here. Yes, and thanks for having me. You're very well. Glad to be doing this. Great. And here in our Spirit Square studio, we welcome back Jeff Smithberger. He's the director of Solid Waste for Mecklenburg County. Prior to that, he ran a similar operation in Fairfax County, Virginia, a suburb of Washington. Welcome to you. Welcome back. Good morning. Thank you. If you'd like to join our conversation, you can do it by uh, getting to us through email at charlottetalks at wfa.org. Search for WFA on Facebook. Get to us through Twitter at Charlotte Talks. Jenna, let me begin with you. Before plastic bottles were all the rage, Bottles were made from glass. Before plastic television set and computer monitors, well, televisions particularly, they were encased in wooden cabinets. Before plastic, groceries were carried home in paper bags. Before plastics, we drank out of water fountains instead of carrying plastic water bottles with us. Except for the water fountain example, we threw all that stuff away at some point in time. So why is throwing plastic away so much worse than throwing glass or wood or some other metal material away? Hmm. That's a great question. You know, um, plastic is a different material. Um, Some of those materials you also mentioned don't biodegrade. But one thing about plastics, which it doesn't biodegrade as well, so it pretty much, um, as far as our practicality, lasts indefinitely. Um, it, we also find that without having some value at end of life, many times those glass bottles were reused, um, it ends up leaking into our environment. And that's where it's been impacting our ecosystems and oceans around the world. I was actually surprised to find when I was reading yesterday that plastics have been around since the late 1800s. I thought they were a 20th century invention, but I guess the 20th century was when they discovered they could make plastic uh, profligately uh, out of out of oil based products when they made when when plastic was starting to come really into vogue in the 1950s and building through the 60s and 70s and 80s did the plastics industry know that this would happen this pollution this this impossible uh, problem of not being able to ever get rid of this stuff did they know that was going to happen or was this just an unintended consequence I I don't think they knew. I mean, I think partly why they were using this material is that people were 
uh, replacing some natural materials. It was providing convenience um, for a society that was quickly evolving. Um, you know, I don't think they gave much thought to the waste management of products. And I find that a lot sort of working in the research. And I'm sure Jeff has found this too. You know, we get whatever comes down the pipe for us to manage. And that's a real challenge when people aren't thinking about designing products for recycling or for easy waste management. And when I talked, uh, Laura, about your being a, a reporter for National Geographic's Planet or Plastic series, I talked about the reason for that series being to raise awareness about what, what you describe, what they describe at National Geographic as a crisis. How serious is this? Uh, well, if we uh, go back a little bit in the history, um, the plastic production uh, really took off after World War II mm -hmm. and, and when m much of the consumer products uh, were made, and it just has accelerated ever since then. Uh, and to the point where now 40% uh, of the market is um, disposable, single-use plastics. And another uh, shocking figure I'll throw at you is that uh, about half or just less than half of the plastic on Earth today was made in the last 15 years. Most of, uh, a lot of the growth has happened uh, in developing nations uh, on the other side of the world that lack the uh, uh, waste management capacity to pick up the trash, and, uh, and there we are today. So if, if, if half of the plastic ever made has been made in the last 15 years, are we finding more uses for it, or are we just wrapping everything in plastic now at the retail level, and that's what's causing that? Well, a combination of both. There are new plastic products uh, that are... Uh, invented all of the time, and there will be more new products that will be invented uh, uh, yeah. after we're finished with this with this conversation this morning. Uh, and a lot of it also is where you know if you go to a grocery store uh, today, and you will see, especially in the produce department, a lot of cut up fruit that's wrapped up, a lot of other plastic uh, uh, encasing uh, food that 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 wasn't done. Uh, maybe a decade ago or 15 years ago. Uh, that's just one example. It, it, it preserves the, the freshness of the produce, uh, but we're seeing a lot of stuff uh, encased in plastic. I actually never thought about this, but the, you, you buy a package of uh, strawberries or you buy some blueberries or you go to the salad bar at the local grocery store, Jeff, and you'll, you'll put it usually in a plastic container, which is you use long enough to carry it home, consume whatever you've bought, and you toss it, in, hopefully, in the recycling, if it's recycled plastic. Would it be better from your point of view, as somebody who has to deal with this stuff, if these containers were made out of something else, like cardboard? Absolutely, positively. And, and we've tried to work with manufacturers, and we work with a group called the Product Stewardship Institute, because people want to do the right thing. However, we're not giving many choices from the manufacturers about doing the right well, thing. Well, it's not just the manufacturers, it seems to me. It's the retailers. I mean, I, is, well, is, is it because we, as consumers like the fact that we can look at our fresh strawberries through this clear plastic as opposed to having it covered up by a piece of cardboard? Absolutely. I mean, it, it, that, that's why they do it that way. It, it's, it's based on Marketing 101. You were able to see how beautiful and fresh the blueberries or the strawberries are, whereas in a cardboard container, well, it's just up to you to figure out when you get home if they're fresh or not. Which is worse, these plastic containers that you have at the grocery stores, or some stores have now begun to use cardboard containers but they appear to be they appear to have a plastic coating on the food surface so it doesn't absorb into the cardboard which is worse <laughs> uh, both are pretty bad for an end of life situation many of the companies that we deal with and we talk to uh deal with manufacturing and shipping but they never ever ever consider end of life and that's where I get involved, is our facilities and infrastructure is all about the end of life of something. And we try our best to find a home for something that's end of life. But we find many times, because of the different formulations of plastics, we're now finding something that's really strange, is that, that folks that used to have a, a pure plastic are now blending it with different plastics. So even though it may look like a polystyrene or it may look like an LDPE, and I'm throwing out some words yes, that are over my head already. Linear low density <laughs> polyethylene. There are about seven 
basic types of plastics. And manufacturers are blending them together because they have now figured out that we like the texture and the way that these things feel. They're great for marketing. They're great for the product. They're great for shipping. But they're absolutely horrendous for the recycling end of the things that we try to do. Because you can't separate them? You can't separate okay. them. And then there's nobody that wants them on the back end because... When somebody recycles something, I'll use an aluminum can for the example. The aluminum can is pretty much an aluminum can. It can be smelted down and reused. But when we get a piece of plastic something, it is generally many different types of, of thermoplastics put together. There is not an end use for it. It cannot be easily remelted down and reused again. Now, we are looking into some plastics to fuel situations, but what we're finding, the economics of doing that yeah. is just not sustainable. So, Jenna, you are famous around the world for helping compile some significant statistics about plastic, the most staggering of which to me was you, the fact that you say we have produced eight billion, with a B, metric tons of plastic since 1950 and have only recycled 9% of it. Put that 8 billion metric tons into perspective. H how can we understand that number? <laughs> I, you know, it's, it's really hard to. You know, we did convert that over into something like 80 million blue whales, but you can't even really imagine that. I mean, it, it's it's really challenging to imagine the weight and the volume of, of that much material. But something I have um, done in some of my classes is have my students record everything they touch in a day that's plastic. Mm -hmm. um, and that is really tangible and sort of eye-opening. And it sort of illustrates maybe sort of your love-hate feeling for this material because I think you can't imagine how your day would go maybe without some of those items and, and what they do for you and what they do for society. And yet at the same time, um, we know of all of these, you know, all of these issues, including the fact that of that 8 billion, 6.4 billion has become waste that we've had to manage. And then you correctly stated about nine and a half percent of that only around the globe has been recycled. And then of course we have the quantity that's leaking into the ocean. And that is 8 million yeah. metric tons per year. That's a good experiment for people who are listening to us right now. Just look around wherever you are, doesn't matter where you are, look around and take an inventory of everything that you see or touch that's made of plastic. In this room that we are sitting in right now, the computer monitor bezels and stands are plastic. The chairs that we're sitting on are plastic. The Formica, I guess, on top of this table is a, is a form of plastic. The wrapping mm -hmm. around the edge of the Formica is plastic. The knobs on the controls are plastic. The computer cabinets are plastic. Little pieces of the microphone stand are plastic. The headphones are plastic. I mean, it, it, it's, uh, it, it just goes on and on and on. Uh, yep. Could anyone have predicted besides the guy from The Graduate that we just played, that plastic would become as ubiquitous as it has become. You know, I think it has been, you know, I think they knew it was going to be super useful because it was the first time there was this material that could really be molded and colored and textured. And, you know, so I, I don't know that they could have predicted, you know, where we are now, but mm -hmm. I think right away people you know, saw how useful it was, and then that's only expanded as chemists have been able to manipulate this material um, and, and polymers themselves. And there, and therein lies the rub and, and the problem in the oceans, which we're going to talk extensively about as we go through this hour. It's Charlotte Talks on WFAE. Support for Charlotte Talks comes from WFAE members and a prettier potty. This More at a prettierpotty.com. Well, coming up tomorrow, it's the local news roundup on this program at 9. Huntersville's Education Advisory Committee recommends a split from CMS. Vice President Mike Pence pays a visit for an RNC kickoff meeting as next year's national convention approaches. The South Carolina House and Senate have approved a $120 million package of tax breaks to lure the Panthers south. And start your engines, ladies and gentlemen. The Coca-Cola 600 is this weekend, and race week is impending. Those stories and more with our roundtable of reporters tomorrow on the Local News Roundup at 9.
Speaker Pelosi is resisting the push to impeach, but for how much longer? I think that's what it's come to. We can't be scared of elections. We need to uphold the rule of law. I think the case gets stronger the more they stonewall the Congress. Democrats say they're at an inflection point, and one Republican lawmaker thinks it's time to act. Will Congress impeach the president? That's next time on 1A. This morning from 10 to noon, right after Charlotte talks with Mike Collins on 90.7 WFAE, Charlotte's NPR News Source. It's Charlotte Talks on listener-funded 90.7 WFAE and 90.3 WFHE. I'm uh, Mike Collins. Jenna Jembeck is with us. She's a National Geographic Fellow and Associate Professor of Environmental Engineering at the University of Georgia. Uh, Jeff Smithberger is with us in our studio. He's Director of Solid Waste for Mecklenburg County. And Laura Parker is a staff writer for National Geographic. Laura, is the problem here the ubiquity that virtually everything we touch in, in the world today contains something made of plastic or the fact that it just doesn't go away when we're done with it, which is the bigger problem. I'm not sure we can say which is the bigger problem. Um, uh, both are true. And to make a, a, a couple of points here, uh, plastic has changed the world and has made life possible for us, the, the life that we live. And uh, plastic is not going to go away. Uh, from our lives. I mean, their medical devices save lives. Uh, I, you know, airplanes and cars are lighter weight, saving fuel, and so on and so on. Uh, the the focus of of our effort at National Geographic, which is to both uh, educate uh, our readers as to the developments as they happen, and they're happening fairly rapidly now, uh, and also to uh, get them to think about their own plastic use. Um, the focus of, of, of all of that is on single-use plastics. Mm. And this is something that, that, that will happen at a, at, a, at the sort of macro level. Industry has to make some decisions about what they want to do and what their role is in this. And I think we've seen in the last year that uh, quite a number of companies have woken up uh, uh, to, uh, to what's, what's happened and are trying to figure out uh, – various ways to uh, uh, redesign their products or to use more recycled material uh, and so on and so forth. And, and then we can go down to the individual consumer level. Um, uh, our uh, Planet for Plastic project uh, launched last June when we issued, when we published the one, the, the issue that sort of gave everyone an introduction to Plastics 101, uh, what's happened and, and where this is headed. And uh, part of that included uh, asking our readers to take a pledge to, to look at their own use. As Jenna mentioned, uh, uh, you know, when she has her students look around at what they touch every year it, with plastic, we, we, are, we are doing something similar with our readers to say, can you, is, there, is there a way for you to reduce your own use, even if it's something small? But, I mean, can, and, can, can we? Because, I mean, I, at the grocery store, you can say paper instead of plastic for, for the bag you, you carry. You can say paper dirt. instead of plastic. You can get a reusable bag. Bag. Um, you don't need to buy necessarily uh, bags that are made for trash bags uh, in your, you know, bathroom. Um, uh, you can use the plastic bag that you carried your groceries home with as a bag. Um, that you know, you can get a reusable bottle. You can. There are many, many ways for people to uh, to assess their use and figure out a smarter way to use it. Uh, and as I said, industry is going to play a big role in here. In you know, there are some products, single-use products, that probably should just go away. And I think the, the companies are figuring out what those are. And what are? And give me an, give me an example. Yeah. Give me an example of a product that should just go away. Okay. So do you? If you're, let's go to the food delivery area, or or take out food. If you're in a restaurant and you're dining in the restaurant. You don't need to be given plastic utensils. If you're going to take your food home, you don't need to have plastic utensils. Um, if you're going to go to a picnic table in a park, you, someone needs to give you plastic utensils. Um, that's a very small example, but okay. there's, a, there's a, a rethink that we need to do on how much of this do we really need. Um, and what should we do about it? And as I said, that's a, that's a tiny example, but uh, 
that's the start. And to go back to our earlier conversation was about a lot about recycling and trash, and, and all of that is at, the, is at the bottom end of the stream or downstream. And we really, uh, both uh, Jeff and Jenna uh, mentioned this, but we really need to go back further upstream and not only look at do we need this, but how can it be redesigned so that it perhaps uses less plastic in the manufacture of it, and uh, and and how can it be uh, wisely collected at the end of its life and remade into something else? So in the 80s, uh, we saw photographs of the uh, of portions because you can't take a photograph of all of it; it's impossible. Uh, of this huge floating island of plastic in the middle of the Pacific that <laughs> some people said was the size of Texas. And we've seen stories and read stories about sea animals washing up on the shore, and when they are autopsied, their stomachs are full of, of plastic. We've seen pictures of beaches covered with detritus that's all made of plastic. In 2015, Jenna, you conducted a groundbreaking study outlining where all this plastic comes from, because a lot of people said people are throwing this stuff overboard from ships. That's not true. Where does it come from? Yeah, so we um, conducted some research uh, looking at mismanaged solid waste on land, so mismanaged municipal waste, and we looked at 192 countries in the world um, that have a coastline because um, we wanted to estimate how much of this was actually reaching the ocean, and we looked at the per-person waste generation rate, so how much waste someone's producing every day, the quantity of that that's plastic, and then from there, the quantity that's mismanaged, and that was either inadequately managed, so inadequate infrastructure in that area, or littered, as we sometimes see people do. Um, and then from there, we had three scenarios of what could actually make it to the ocean. And our mid-estimate uh, for that research was that 8 million metric tons was reaching the oceans every year. Um, again, a hard number to imagine. So um, let's imagine us all standing hand to hand, covering the entire coastline of the world, looking out at the ocean. Each one in front of us would have five grocery size bags filled with plastic, and that's what we uh, estimate is going in every year. But, but is it coming from all over the world? I mean, are people in, on the Mediterranean in France and Italy throwing uh, plastic bottles into the Mediterranean? Are people in England throwing them into the English Channel? Are we throwing them into the Atlantic and Pacific and the Gulf of, of Mexico? Uh, or, or is it coming from a specific area of the world? So there's... Um, so what we did is we looked at influencing factors um, because this has it has both... Uh, geographic variation and temporal variation and it really was highly dependent on where you saw adequate waste management infrastructure and so a lot of rapidly developing middle-income countries around the world um, we're seeing this increase in economic growth and then along with that comes this increase in waste generation including plastic but then the infrastructure to manage that plastic lags behind um, and so that's where we saw a lot of plastic leaking out. However, the U.S., for example, was in the list of top 20. And I feel like mm -hmm. I can call that country out because I'm a U.S. citizen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're there because we produce so much waste per person. Many of these countries that I'm that um, are rapidly developing are still producing very little waste per person. But we produce three to four times as much per person. So even a small amount of leakage from us then had this contribution. So I think it's important to understand those factors. From what I read yesterday, a lot of this stuff is coming from Asia, Vietnam, uh, China particularly, and, and other countries. And I, it's, there's a little irony in there because for the longest time, China has taken in a lot of the world's plastic to be recycled, and yet they don't seem to have a, a infrastructure for their own citizens to uh, recycle their own materials. Would that be accurate? Yeah, you know, they, they were as the manufacturing hub of the world, um, and we published some research on this as well, uh, for 28 years, you know, importing the material. Um, and they did. They, they had an operation to be able to take that material in and get that to manufacturing facilities, but had not been able to develop the internal mm. infrastructure. Now, with the ban, 
that they instituted um, this past year or the end of 2017, they um, have now started really developing and sourcing a lot of their material um, domestically as well, as well as importing industrial pellets still. So quick question, questions here now for, for Jeff uh, Smithberger, who's the director of solid waste here in Mecklenburg County. Why did the county start a recycling program? Was it to make money or was it because we had a genuine concern about and a genuine need to recycle because all this stuff was filling the landfills. <clears throat> the, the latter. It's the uh, the fact that we were filling landfills up. We had and why is that a problem? Just because there's not enough land to go around, not well, enough landfill uh, area. Well, well, let's face it. If I come knocking at your door and say, "Hey, I want to build a new landfill in your community," mm -hmm. um, I'm not welcomed with open arms, and so uh, it is very difficult to site and design a, a new landfill facility. So we try to cherish. And, and keep the ones that we have for those things that we just absolutely don't have uh, ability to recycle anything. But Mecklenburg County, as I understand, is one of the few municipalities that has its own recycling processing center. That is correct. Why? Most of the times, uh, the recycling processing centers are owned by large corporations. Um, we are one of the few communities in the United States that have chosen to own our own, and therefore we control our own destiny because we can decide what we're going to take in. And we are not in the for-profit business. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with for-profit businesses, but those folks do things for a monetary bottom line. We do things for a sustainability indice that we work with. And so I'm not concerned if I can't make a certain profit on a certain material. I'm concerned that I am keeping things out of a landfill, that my sustainability factor is the fact that we're not putting things back into a landfill facility. Uh, despite our recycling efforts here and around the country, I I'm sure that a lot of plastic ends up uh, being being collected as trash and then sent to a landfill. How much recyclable plastic would you say ends up in Mecklenburg County landfills that could have gone to you? We did a trash sort study about three years ago, and in that study we found that we had about 20% uh, materials that, that could be recycled again. And of that 20%, about 12% was w would have been plastic material. So our thing, you just held up an aluminum can as an example when I was talking to Laura about how, decisions that consumers could make. Don't buy the bottled soft drink, buy it in a can because the aluminum can is recyclable. Is it infinitely recyclable? You mean the aluminum can? Yeah. Uh, um, there, there's a limit to everything in the world, but it is a lot better to recycle the aluminum than it is something that's plastic. And I had a conversation with somebody who's in the bottling industry about three months ago, and I said, why do you make your sodas both in an aluminum can and a plastic bottle? And why do they? And they said the consumers demand it. And I and they said they want the screw on top on the bottle. And and why I said, can't well, they put a screw on top? Of, they do put the screw on top now on top well, of they aluminum. Can. Cans. Why they, can't they do that? Well, absolutely, Mike. They can. Because the bottles do not hold carbonated beverages for the same amount of time that glass or cans do. <laughs> they get flat. In and, the plastic. And, and, and I agree with that. But they're telling me that they have a marketing staff, and their marketing staff determines how many bottles that they're going to run and how many aluminum cans that they're going to run. So, and it's based upon the consumers buying it. So Chris emails, how many times can glass, paper, and plastic materials be recycled? What is the degradation, and how does that determine what products can subsequently be produced until we arrive at an item that cannot be recycled? Each one of those have a different life factor, and it depends upon what life they're using. If there are, if if the material is supposed to be a beverage container, it's going to be different than it's going to be. Uh, I'm trying to think of an industrial use for something, and so we try to look at the items that we have an available market for. And right now, there is a robust market for aluminum cans. There is not so much of a robust market for PETE bottles. We have a hard time finding vendors that want to take it all. One of the reasons why is we don't get it in a pristine state. The things that we get are post-consumer. If we could get it pre-consumer, there's a greater market for it, <laughs> but we don't. And trying to They're find... They're not going to make it just so you can recycle it. No, no. I, <laughs> and I get that. I get that. And, but keep in mind that, you know, we ask for things to be clean, dry, and loose. Yeah. Very few times do we get something that's clean or dry. Uh, and then the loose part is when they're putting it inside of a plastic bag. Now, Jenna, I, I'm told you like to crawl around landfills. <laughs> 
and uh, sometimes you take other people with you. God knows how you get them to go. But uh, <laughs> in, in a conversation with NPR, you pointed out that in a landfill, microbes work to degrade food and other organic garbage. Metals corrode and dissolve. You say everything returns to the earth except plastic. What is it about plastic? It's, it's a product of oil which came from the earth. What okay. is it about plastic that refuses to decay? Because I have put things in the attic in plastic garbage bags for storage mm -hmm. and two years later go and pick them up and they just fall apart in my hands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, so the, the carbon in a polymer um, is in these long chain carbon compounds. And so it's really hard for microbes to actually access that carbon like they can um, in other materials. And um, but what we do see, though, is because the, the molecules, the carbon itself isn't being consumed, but the plastic can get brittle. So it, it like oxidizes when it's exposed to air and that makes it brittle. And especially like the film plastic, the bags you're talking about, those will kind of feel like they're disintegrating. But all it's doing is breaking up into smaller and smaller mm. pieces. And that's what we see happening in our environment and in our oceans. Um, it fragments. It's called microplastic. Um, and that's another one of the, the reasons plastic is so different as a material. Laura, you wrote, I think it was an article for National Geographic, in which you said that if plastic had been invented when the pilgrims came to America and the Mayflower had been stocked with bottled water and plastic-wrapped snacks, their plastic trash would likely still be around today, four centuries later. Does this stuff ever decay, ever, or do we know? Well... We haven't been around for 400 <laughs> years since plastic was invented. Uh, the point is, is ooh, both what Jenna and, and Jeff have said. It doesn't. It doesn't break down, um, and so there's a lot of work being done now to invent a biodegradable plastic uh, or a compostable plastic. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, we are sort of signaling a, a great caution on this for people who think that this is the answer to all their problems or to our the world's problem on plastic um, because uh, for a variety of reasons, and I don't want to take up uh, uh, the rest of the hour with this, but um, people should not get the idea, well, I can just toss this aside. You know, let's just throw it in the ocean because it will eventually biodegrade. Right now there is no biodegradable product that will will biodegrade in the ocean because the oceans are too cold. Um, uh, compostable products generally need to be uh, composted in an industrial composter, and not all people or communities have access to that. Uh, and so while we're, st and we're still talking about the back end of plastics, um, there are some really large questions that need to be asked and pursued, and I think they're being pursued. Um, but uh, let me sort of frame it in a different way. In 20 seconds. Right now, today, 2 billion people on this planet lack access to waste management systems. Uh. Plastic production is expected to double by 2050. Um, those two things don't square right because by 2050, it'll be, I think, 3 billion people who lack access to waste management systems. Laura Parker writes for National Geographic. Jenna Jembeck is an associate professor in environmental engineering at the University of Georgia. And Jeff Smithsberger runs the solid waste here in Mecklenburg County. We're coming right back. Support for Charlotte Talks comes from WFAE members and Catawba College Salisbury, where 96% of graduates leave college either with a job or with acceptance into graduate school. Catawba College, whose mission is to transform, inspire, and help students belong. Catawba.edu. Throughout American history, there have been periods of intense friction between the executive and legislative branches of government. With the power struggle between President Trump and the Democratic-led House, we are in such a period right now. So how effective is the system of checks and balances today? What is the likelihood that Congress will impeach the president? That's what they'll be talking about in 20 minutes with Joshua Johnson and his guests on 1A. And we have much more to talk about with regard to how plastic is polluting our environment when we come back. Stay with us. 
Hi, it's Peter Sagal here at Wait Wait. We sit around a table covered in junk food and gossip magazines and try to figure out what's funny about this week's news. Then we get bored and start reading Us Weekly. Did you know celebrities are just like us? This all costs money, people. So please consider donating your old car, the one covered in its own junk food, to us. We'll turn it into the programs you love, like Wait Wait. Here's how. Look for the WFAE vehicle donation link under the support tab at WFAE.org for all the details. It's Charlotte Talks on WFAE and WFHE. I'm Mike Collins. We're talking about plastic today and the fact that it's all around us. It never goes away, and it's causing significant problems in nature around the world. Uh, Jenna Jembach is one of the leading researchers in that area of this conversation. She's a National Geographic Fellow and an Associate Professor of Environmental Engineering at the University of Georgia. Laura Parker writes about this constantly for National Geographic and their Planet or Plastics series. And Jeff Smithberger is with us. He is the Director of Solid Waste in Mecklenburg County, and he informs me that in the fall, you do not, use, you do not need to use plastic leaf bags you can use craft paper, and Mecklenburg County gives that away in the fall. We do. We uh, encourage people not to use plastic bags because it's uh, not good for our composting process. Uh, there are a number of alternatives to not use a plastic bag. We give away uh, about seventy-five to 80,000 craft paper bags. And there's a local company here called Leaf Burrito, and they have a really unique product uh, that can be used to, uh, to, to bring leaves to the curb. So we, th- there are many ways that people can not use plastics. They just got to take an extra 10 or 15 seconds to think about things and try it a different way. Okay. So, Jenna, plastic is all around us. We've established that, uh, and maybe you can't answer the question, but what uh, what kinds of plastic products are most frequently found in the wild? The ones that are washing up on beaches in that island in the middle of the uh, Pacific and, and in animals? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, no, we do know there's over 30 years, um, the Ocean Conservancy has organized this international coastal cleanup. Um, we have a, a mobile app called Marine Debris Tracker that people all over the world report to us what they find. And as you heard Laura refer to single use plastic items before, that is what we are finding. So plastic bags, water bottles, bottle caps, cigarette butts are actually the number one item because most people don't realize that the filters inside them are cellulose acetate, which is a polymer. And um, food wrappers. Food Mm. wrappers have been just progressively moving up this list. Um, And I have been in like six countries in the past eight weeks or eight countries in the past six weeks and just that is what I've been seeing, uh, tremendously snacked items, wrappers from those all over. Now, there are going to be p- people listening who say, okay, so there are a couple Coke bottles floating around in the middle of the Pacific, or maybe you'll go down as a deep diver or you'll send a sub down, and you'll find that there are pl- there's plastic debris on the ocean floor. The oceans are vast. There's far more ocean than there is land on the globe. Why is this such a problem? Mm-hmm. You know, you're right. The oceans are really vast. And and in fact, before plastic was around, um, people were using it, using waterways and watercourses to dispose of waste. Um, But why is it so different now that, you know, plastic is there? So in the ocean, um, gosh, there's all kinds of things. Microbes colonize plastic and then it smells like food to seabirds. So um, ingestion and entanglement are two of the, the most widely known about impacts to animals. So animals ingest plastic. Um, if it doesn't pass through their system, they feel full. They starve to death. And we see this a lot in seabirds. Um, a lot of whales recently have been washing up on shores and plastic bags have been found in their stomachs. Uh, sea turtles mistake plastic bags for jellyfish. Um, we also know plastics sorb uh, persistent organic pollutants. So if those are in the environment, then they sorb to the plastic and the plastic can transport those um, into animals and around the world um, and transport invasive species. So it has all of these interactions with our environment and many of them we really don't know the full sort of impact of what they're having. And although everything you've just talked about is harmful, it's one thing to have plastic bottles and plastic bags floating in the sea environment and having animals ingest them. But there's the danger that also comes from something called microplastics, Laura. What are they and why are they harmful? 
Microplastics are created when plastic products in the ocean break down from wave action and sunlight, and they become uh, there's they're essentially the uh, pieces of plastic or, uh, that are about the size of a grain of rice and or smaller, mm -hmm. and they continue to break down into what's known now as nanoplastics. So they keep getting smaller and smaller, and these are things that uh, also are consumed by uh, fish and birds uh, and so on, and uh, all small organisms in the ocean. Uh, we published a story in the current issue, the May issue, about research that's, that uh, is going on in Hawaii of uh, fish nurseries, which are areas uh, off the coast of the islands where larval fish uh, spend the first few weeks of their life. And uh, they discovered that these larval fish are eating uh, nanoplastics as sometimes their first meal. And at that stage of life when 99% uh, of larval fish don't make it anyway, which is by natural design, mm -hmm. um, now we've introduced, man has introduced a new element here, which is plastic. And, and so the question is unanswered, but is there ha are, the, are, are we affecting fish populations and the ability of fish population to reach the size it's supposed to reach in order to become food for larger fish or grow into fish themselves? Um, are we upsetting that balance now because fish, larval fish, are eating nanofibers as their first meal? And, and let's stay, let's stay in Hawaii for a second because I read something I think you wrote yesterday that really shocked me. Uh, you say it is estimated that on the big island of Hawaii, as much as 15% of the sand on the beaches is actually grains of microplastic. Yeah, that's not on all of the beaches. That's just been found in some areas. It depends on where the where the the beaches are on the islands. And uh, uh, but this was a study done by some scientists who were paying attention to uh, what was coming off the Pacific Gyre. And you made reference to this floating island in the center of the Pacific Gyre earlier. It's not really an island. If you sailed out there, you wouldn't see anything. There's just nothing to stand on. It's just Think of it more as a soup. Uh, there's a lot of fishing gear out there, but there's also a, a lot of microplastics, and these things work their way onto the beach and then get embedded into the beach uh, in, in various places uh, with various concentrations. And that, uh, depending on how much uh, is embedded, it could affect things like sand temperature or how quickly water, the composition of the beach, how does water flow through it, uh, that in turn can affect um, uh, nesting of sea turtles. Uh, um, uh, the sex, the gender of a sea turtle is determined by the temperature of the sand and how long the egg incubates. So it could ultimately, if it were to get bad enough, if the microplastics were to be abundant enough, uh, it could have effectively uh, um, affect the gender of sea turtles. Mm. So this, this really affects so many things that we don't even think about, and the ocean breaks down this plastic to this invisible level, and that gets into the beaches, it gets into the uh, 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 food supply of, of the fishes that just suck in vast amounts of water, and, and they, they think they're, they're full, but they're not because they're full of plastic, and there's no, there's no nutritional value to that whatsoever. Um, the world has this recycling system. Most places, most civilized places in the world have recycling uh, uh, infrastructure. We certainly do here, but you were on this program not too long ago, or maybe a year or so ago, Jeff, and we talked about how the recycling system is breaking down if it's not already broken. How would you characterize it? Recycling has certainly changed from a marketing standpoint. Um, many of our consumers are confused about what they can and can't recycle. Many think that anything made of plastic from a child's car seat to uh, a, a, a soccer ball are recyclable, and that just isn't necessarily the case. We're trying to educate people about uh, the choices that they make and the things that they procure as well as their end-of-life situation and what we can and can't recycle. We are on the downstream end. We are sort of hamstrung by what manufacturers make things out of. We try to encourage manufacturers to make things out of things that we can easily recycle. 
uh, high-density polyethylene. If you think about your laundry detergent bottle, it's generally high-density polyethylene. If you think about your milk one-gallon jug, it's, it's, a, it's a type of plastic that we can easily recycle. But if manufacturers make things out of things that we can't utilize and find a market for, we're caught in the middle. People get mad at us. Um, the recycling markets have changed. And from a for-profit situation, uh, it's not as advantageous to be in that business. The economics don't work anymore. Why not? Well, the economics don't work. One of the reasons is because if, if people are using food-grade things, such as a water bottle, that water bottle is not going to get turned into a water bottle again when it gets recycled. It's going to be a, a, a plastic something. It's going to be a uh, floor covering. It might be a shirt. But it doesn't go back to the same so thing. So some areas have banned plastic grocery bags. Not all, but some. Uh, how, how serious are they? Can they be recycled? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, we, 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 as we've been sitting here talking, you pointed out that on one of the telephone wires across the street from the window that we, we're looking through right here is a Mylar balloon. There was a festival downtown a couple of weeks ago, and one of those Mylar balloons, I guess, got caught up in the wires, and it's been there ever since. And it's going to be there till the wind blows it away, and then God knows where it will go. Is that recyclable? Mylar balloons are generally not recyclable. Then why are they allowed to be manufactured? That's a great question for the folks in the political world. You had mentioned that uh, uh, there there are certain plastic bag bans, but one of the things that I have noticed is that the plastic bag bans, when they are enacted, generally get overturned. If you look at North Carolina, North Carolina's Outer Bank areas had a plastic bag ban. That was overturned. South Carolina's has been overturned. Uh, Alabama's has been overturned. And and so the legislative groups pass legislation, and then there are lobbyist groups that come in and say, hey, we, we really need to make these again. So Jenna, if there, I don't know whether you can answer this question, but do you know uh, that when, if politicians are presented with this or with, when companies are presented with the knowledge that this Mylar balloon that's hanging up there on that telephone wire cannot be recycled, it's going to last for, forever, is there any will to either ban them or for the manufacturers to say, we're not going to make this anymore? Or is it all on the backs of consumers to say, that's not recyclable, I'm not buying it, and therefore the market will crash? No, well, I, I think governments, um, cor- companies and corporations um, and citizens all need to come together on this issue. Um, and Governments are going to be passing policies. Um, You know, places like Hawaii, we were talking about that, have basically all the counties in Hawaii, so they basically have a plastic bag ban um, for the state. And specifically, you know, those blow away. Um, They are difficult to manage in the solid waste stream. They can be recycled, but usually not in your curbside bin. And they cause actually a lot of tangles um, at materials recovery mm-hmm. facilities, and I'm sure Jeff could elaborate. But so there's other problems with certain materials and products outside of the ocean. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, you know, sometimes it takes a policy. Companies are waking up to this issue because they know if something can't be recycled, it typically has less value and is more likely to leak out. Um, they're trying to use more recycled materials um, in the packaging um, that they're producing. And then the citizens uh, try to make choices, but I think we do know that it's very confusing because the plastic space is um, quite complex. And we talked about sort of the blends of materials. Partly what we need to do is collect sort of baseline information to inform, I think, governments. And that's something we're doing with National Geographic on our sea to source um, expeditions and trying to get this data and information to communities and to decision makers so that they can figure out what the next steps to do are. So let me go through some questions that have come through from listeners while we've been talking here. Kate on Twitter, <coughs> excuse me, how can we truly make a significant impact in education in order to make a dramatic shift in future use and consumption? Where is the fight? What can we do to get boots on the ground to help? I'm not sure which one of you can answer that. Jeff? I think... Uh, Laura, go ahead. Go ahead, Laura. uh, That's part of why we launched this campaign. It was to educate our readers. We have an enormous reach across the world with um, not only the magazine and its uh, more than 30 foreign uh, language editions, but also uh, on social media and uh, on our website, uh, which publishes daily uh, uh, news. 
uh, including our, our work on plastics. Uh, a lot of schools are starting it. Uh, I think uh, legislative uh, branches um, in various states are educating themselves. Uh, uh, there are a lot of NGOs who are trying to bring attention to this issue, and, uh, and the industry itself has, has awakened uh, to what's going on and what the, what the solutions need to be. But these, there are a lot of really, really difficult questions that need to be answered, um, one of which on plastic bags is it's cheaper to make new bags out of virgin plastic than it is to, mm. to collect them all again and ship them back to the, to the bag factory and remake them, melt them down and make them into something new. Um, that's just one example. So for every answer we may come up with right today, there will be five more questions that need to be asked. So I have a, I have a minute left, and Tom emails, the discussion appears to be centered on the food industry, and we have talked a lot about food packaging. Hardware, drug, other hard goods vendors use a lot of plastic, especially on small things that they want to make difficult to steal. If you try to buy a printer cartridge, it's going to be an impossible to open cardboard wrapped in plastic. Uh, where Consumers seem to be at the... Uh, we're captured in this. We can't do anything about that, can we? Well, I, I tell folks to please send an email. We all have voices. Uh, everyone has a smartphone and a, an account. Send an email to the manufacturers that are making these things. Let them know that you don't like it. Okay. And does the county have, Leanne on Facebook, does the county plan to do any kind of campaign to better educate citizens about all of this? Great question. Thanks for that one. But yes, wipeoutwaste.com is our website in the county, wipeoutwaste.com. We are taking out billboard ads, uh, television ads. We're trying to reach folks. Let them know. That's uh, Jeff Smithberger, who's the director of Solid Waste for Mecklenburg County. Also joining us, uh, the, one of the leading scientists in the world on, on discovering how bad the situation is, General Jembeck, National Geographic Fellow, Associate Professor of Environmental Engineering at the University of Georgia, and Laura Parker, staff writer for National Geographic. Thank you all for the hour. Charlotte Talk.